uh, we have now time for discussion. So we can ask questions about any of the talks that were done in the afternoon, or we can have discussions about other things. Students, postdocs, don't be shy. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of stuff here. Does it sound crazy? I don't know. I mean, when we when we heard about this, we thought you know it sounds kind of crazy, but um, it, it it is uh, sh uh, turning out to be maybe quite useful. So, uh, you know, we want to hear feedback. I don't know if you think it's crazy or not. Brooks, tell me what do you right. think? So Honest. It doesn't conflict with anything that uh, that I presented earlier. I, I am curious. Um, have you considered looking at sleep because? We know that uh, systems, you know, networks uh, are very different. It's not that they're off, obviously. Sleep's doing something. And when, since that's where you have long-term memory consolidation, um, might there be a, a more effective uh, treatment as far as the feedback goes if it's during, during sleep rather than awake? Um, I actually forgot to mention, so you guys probably noticed this in a, a rotated version. That is actually the NeuroPace RNS device. And the good thing is there, it might, there might be a possibility to do that because you can um, program that device to do recording at certain times. Now the tricky part is it can only uh, record for seven and a half minutes. Uh, because it's a rolling buffer, it's going to overwrite itself. So. At the moment, with the current technology, we don't have um, that opportunity. But hopefully, if you guys um, uh, come up with with a plan, then well, we can. Advanced device is ready. Well, yes. But you can use it, so it'll be responsive during sleep. So, if, I mean, this is like a scientific book. If they were having some nightmare or something, and all of a sudden the mental activity goes crazy in the middle of the night, then it would respond. I mean, it's 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 just responding to. It would respond. By the way, I'm saying theoretically, but we are waiting for a grant uh, funding to actually try this in five patients. So the device we're using is that device, which would be responsive during the night as well as during the day. Um, for sleep recording, what she's saying is that you can schedule it in advance to, to rec record during sleep if there's a scheduled time, or you could bring them in to the UCLA and do sleep studies, you know, they're obviously more difficult. Um, or just do it in the epilepsy patients Sleep is a very interesting thing to look at for both memory consolidation and also, um, uh, sorry, emotional uh, regulation of memory consolidation in amygdala. So um, it's something that we definitely think about. And Itzhak Fried is going to be working on sleep quite a bit in the next few years. So given the grant that's funded, I think. Okay. Hi, this might be silly, um, but I wanted to know so if you're trying to establish when someone is feeling fear and then shut that down, essentially, is there a way to be um, like aware of context? Like, is there something that's different in PTSD versus like a generalized fear? Because, you know, having that response is, yeah, helpful. Um, or maybe a way for the patient to control it, because I imagine they know when they're having a PTSD reaction versus being able to respond in the general environment. Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question, and you know, we uh, we don't really think about the amygdala as much. We've lately now started to think about it, so we're not. Def I'm definitely not an expert in the in this part. We have Michael Fanzel helping us, and Avi, if he's still here. But yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it, with the system as it stands right now, no. I mean, they can, we can turn it on and off. They, can, the patient themselves, can they? They can't. They cannot turn it on and off. Um, they can do a, a wand swipe, which will trigger a recording. Uh, if they feel like they had some event, like a PTSD-related event. But yeah, no, obviously there may be some types of fear that are good. What, we're, what, what JP is thinking mostly is that in this one patient and now two patients who've been implanted with the Medtronic device, continuous stimulation seems to be very positive and not so much negative. So if continuous is working somehow, can you get the same response with a responsive system that doesn't have to be continuous? and maybe work better, but who knows, yeah. These are all things we have to explore and investigate, and this is just the beginning. Can you interview them to see if they still experience, like, Regular fear. Uh, the first paper's published, uh, but in uh, the first patient, the second, 
is definitely showing improvement. I think it's been six months or so since they were implanted. Um, I don't know all the details in terms of like what they're testing. There, there's a whole bunch of things that they're testing, uh, which I, I would assume that they're doing that. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, one thing we will be looking at is, you know, we just got a biopack system. So we're going to look at skin conductance and heart rate and all these other metrics, um, but and do fear condition tasks and do IAPS tasks and do memory, emotional memory tasks. I mean, we got to do all of that to see what what's going on with the with the brain, but also maybe eventually what stimulation is doing to those behaviors and to the brain activity. Lots of questions, so I don't have the but, answers. But that brings up another point. Yeah. We all often get um, obsessed with the signals that we analyze, and there's no reason at all why a advanced neurotechnology or neuromodulatory system can't take in multiple different um, bio signals, right? So heart rate, can use, any physiological signal should be able to be integrated into a closed loop responsive system, right? We have the opposite extreme. There's a, a vagus nerve stimulator for epilepsy, and that system right now is has a responsive component, which it responds to increases in heart rate, uh, which are very non-specific for seizures. 80% of people who have seizures have an increase in their heart rate, but turns out we all have increases in our heart rate for various reasons. So there's a lot of false positives. False positives aren't always a bad thing, um, but uh, but we need to we need to think outside the box, right? We can't just think about the signals that we are used to looking at because it turns out people are real life human things that live in a real world, not just someone who's tied to a bed with wires coming out of their head. Uh, so it's it's hard to translate what we record into a real life situation. But in, in, at the end of the day, for the patient, you know, the, these patients especially, they're just hoping for you know like less of these episodes, right? And when these episodes happen, they're totally debilitating. They can't function. Their day is completely done. You know, so if it can just do that, you know, obviously we want to do more. But, you know, it was like the morning conversation that we had too, which is function, you know, versus full recovery of all functions, right? We, the minimal function that can, can be done uh, for the patient is at the end of the day sometimes more important too. So, yeah. But I, I think ultimately you, you said something that was interesting challenge you a little bit okay. you know you said con continuous stimulation is good there's nothing bad about it so why are we well, wasting time trying sure. to figure out responsive stimulation well okay so where is time why, why, you why had a waste, great answer I oh look. good taxes for the money you're yeah, spending so on. lots of re well one okay battery right devices okay. right you don't have to okay. change the battery every few years so we'll make, a surgery. make a rechargeable device for continuous right but is it no so one i might so, so this RNS system is you can characterize, right? If you're doing continuous stimulation, and you know this more than I, it's like we want to characterize the signals. We want to move the signs forward. And that's what these uh, five, you know, five patients, I'm sure JP thought of this, like do I do go with, a, you know, just Medtronic because it worked, or do this, which in this case you can characterize and start to learn more about what's happening. And maybe, you know, I, I'm not a clinician on the PTSD side, so I don't know all the ins and outs of the side effects, and this is only been short term, right? So what are, you can tell me in Parkinson's, are there, is in Parkinson's, is is there a need for responsive rather than continuous? I mean, it's a different thing. Parkinson's symptoms are more continuous. PTSD and epilepsy are not, they're more episodic. Um, so those are some things I would say maybe on the battery side, the characterization for the science side, and maybe it'll work better, we don't know, and what would you say? Yeah, you I, I mean, I, I, I'm all for responsive stimulation. I just, sort of just to yeah, no, start no. a conversation. Um, but it, I think it's a constant struggle or constant discussion between what's interesting scientifically, right? So a lot of the motivation you gave was to understand the science underlying PTSD, you know, engineering feats and what's clinically necessary mm -hmm. um, and what that functional endpoint. So you just, that's why it's good to be in a multidisciplinary team where you're constantly balancing mm -hmm. these ideas back and forth and asking why are we doing this and I think all of the you know I had a recent discussion I can't remember with who but there's been it, it's as if science for the sake of science is no longer valuable right to, to just understand the brain is not that important if it's not going to directly lead to a therapeutic change which I think those of us who are in the midst of all this think that's probably not true uh, but although I think uh, there seems to be less enthusiasm for that but uh uh, hopefully we can keep that spark alive to still try to understand the brain. Yeah. 
Um, what, it, when it comes to when it comes to uh, feedback systems or not, um, continuous stimulation or not, is it just, as you said, a question of battery life? Um, or are we having also side effects that might be um, there if you're continuously simulating and it might be better to not do that? I don't know, is there, are there any? Yeah, yeah, no, there are. There are. Yeah. So yeah. for example, with, with Parkinson's disease, we know that stimulation uh, of the subthalamic nucleus can result in uh, impulsive behaviors depending on where you stimulate and so you know and Parkinson's disease although it, it's not episodically like PTSD is it, there's definitely fluctuations throughout the day right so me people take medications the therapy is changing they're not in a constant brain state so um, but I, I do think reducing side effects is actually a big motivation for doing responsive stimulation and it goes back to what your question was which was there may be some functions for which the amygdala is natural you know, function is important for that if continuous stimulation is there, maybe it's not really, you know, allowing it to do its thing normally when it doesn't need to be inhibited or stimulated. Um, you know, but adding emotional context to our memories is probably quite important, even for a PTSD patient, I would think, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I struggle. So we've, we've gone through in the field of brain stimulation over the last five years or so, there's been an increased recognition that we are not modulating a certain target of the brain. We're modulating brain networks. That probably came out in several uh, talks we just heard in the last talk. Um, unfortunately, we're falling into the trap because our devices are only able to do it. Uh, feeling like the biomarkers, you know, the biomarker in this area is the key to success, right? And so suddenly it's just the amygdala signal. I'm, I'm being yeah, overly so, uh, extreme in my interpretation, but that amygdala signal now tells you everything you need to know for reason, and that's probably not the case. Um, and just like we've moved from target to network uh, concepts for neuromodulation, I think we're gonna, it's, it's eventually responsive stimulation is gonna be multimodal in nature, whether it's multiple nodes in the brain where you're recording signals or whether it's brain signals and activity signals or some kind of environmental factor. I mean, there's, it's gonna be much more complex than we can imagine here. And it's gonna be different depending on the disease that you want to treat, and I think. A lot of ways we are limited by the technology that we have right now. And that's right. one of the reasons this, this is happening now. But you, you only have data on one subject. It's one subject. We have, we have upcoming in this next few weeks, uh, a few more subjects coming in, but they have epilepsy comorbid with PTSD. So we, it's hard to get to do this in lots of PTSD patients without like a lots of funding and things like that. So um, we're going to instead bring in epilepsy patients that have the RNS system in the amygdala and hippocampus, so same area, but um, are also comorbid with PTSD, so they come from the VA and as well. That's one way to try to get more data, but this is the, the first patient, so it's, it's promising in the sense that if we see it in more patients, maybe we can be more confident. Yeah. But I, I want to raise another point. In, um, so the epilepsy platform, and we use uh, the DBS platform as a means of collecting data on our patients, but um, you know, I, I proposed um, many years ago the idea of why can't we monitor people with other diseases just like we do for epilepsy to learn about them. And um, when I first proposed that in the setting of depression, I got a lot of pushback. People thought, that's crazy. Why would you put electrodes in someone's brain who has depression just to understand how depression affects the brain? I kept saying it over and over again. And so, and finally, we got a taker. Um, so we proposed to the NIH to do a, a study of patients with depression and saying, you know, we don't want to study depression networks in people who have epilepsy with comorbid depression. We actually want to study patients with depression, real depression that needs therapy. Um, and we propose to put them in the epilepsy monitoring unit, just like patients with epilepsy, with depth electrodes in their brain and brain stimulators, and study them. Because at some point, you just have to learn about the science of the brain in order to develop new therapies. And uh, it took about five or six years of saying that over and over again before. I, I used to go to meetings and people would say, that's crazy. And then the last meeting, which was a, a think tank that I went to, people said, that is that is that is a great idea. Why, why <laughs> weren't we switch. doing that? Right, it's so it switches. So sometimes <laughs> it just takes a while for people to yeah. catch up. But I think um, we need to keep an eye on the, the science and understanding the brain. You know, we went through an era of brain stimulation, where you just 
throw an electrode in someone's brain and hope that it works. And if it didn't work, well, that's it. It didn't work. We didn't learn anything from it. We're really, we need to uh, learn from every step that we take. And if a therapy doesn't work, at least we've learned something about it so we can take the next steps and develop uh, further ideas. Yeah, and to repeat what you said earlier, Reggie, is we're trying to char fully characterize every pa patient. So like the RNS patients, the blind patients coming back to us in a, in a few weeks and just take a few number of patients, but really do lots of different types of ex experiments, cognitive tasks, testing, biometrics, you know, everything on few numbers rather than lots of these and not, you know, looking at them in detail. So that's another thing I think that we need to focus on. Is there general satisfaction of uh, a reasonable quantitative analysis of what, what PTSD is? Sorry. Reasonable quantitative analysis of what PTSD is? You mean behaviorally or or just? Physiologically, behaviorally. I know very little about PTSD. I also know very little about <laughs> <laughs> Where's uh, your Avi? Avi is. So, um, you know, I, we went, we, we reached out to Avi, who's just been hired, who does this, and also Michael Fanslow. But, you know, the problem is that the rodent studies, they're using these, like, fear-conditioned models. And so, so no, I don't think so. But, I, again, I'm not the expert here. I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but there are people that know who are here at UCLA. But um, well, at least no more than me. Aren't there, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of expertise here at UCLA to... Yes to characterize long-term recordings of multiple physiological uh, procedures uh, to, to get a careful characterization of what the spontaneous activity, the heart rate, uh, a number of things. Yes, that and that's could. why we just, um, like I said, did, you know, JP was doing these, this with, you know, his team in sort of a more of a silo, like not really working. So he's now reached out to everyone and we've got all the new equipment to do all of that. We just haven't started yet. It's also tricky to like sync. We're, we're dealing with some issues with just making sure the signals are all synced up and working with the implant, you know, but that's exactly what we want to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry, go ahead. So for the closed loop stimulation for PTSD, do you notice that the brain will adapt to your closed loop stimulation? So now I can imagine if someone's going through a PTSD like episode, they'll have like the imagination and the sensory, you know, stimulation or input for a PTSD episode, but it elicits no fear because you're stimulating the amygdala. So now do you see some sort of adaptation? So now that they imagine this, that they no longer feel, feel fear. So now, you know, you might see less episodes in the future. Uh, that's an interesting point. Um, I would argue that at least for the five, six months, there was no sign of adaptation because uh, the be they were improving, behaviorally speaking. And I think that's one of the reasons why they increased the voltage of stimulation to make sure that adaptation won't happen. And it turned out that it actually made things worse. So uh, my guess would be that it would be determined based on a patient to patient basis. And then um, I'm sure like they can adjust uh, stimulation parameters accordingly. At least it doesn't happen within the, the first six months or so. So that's another really interesting factor is that um, a lot of these neuropsychological or neuro neuropsychiatric diagnoses, the response is not immediate, right? So it's cumulative over time. So we theoretically we have this perfect, let's say we have this perfect biomarker, we know what to respond, what to stimulate in response to, but it could still take three or six months or 12 months to get a maximal response. You know, epilepsy is a response of stimulation. You're responding to a signal that is theoretically a seizure, but it takes a long time for the patient to really get the maximal effect. So that really doesn't make sense, right? So if you're actually responding to the pathophysiological signal, you theoretically should get an immediate response. So there's something more complex or deeper to this. You know, the brain is adapting in some way to the therapy. Any other questions? So path forward. I think um, a lot of people have uh, come and gone. We're going to follow up with an email. We're going to continue with, um, we've been, we did monthly seminars. We took the summer off. If anyone's interested in you know, presenting your work at a monthly seminar, if there's someone you think we should invite to UCLA to sort of promote the discussion about neurotechnology, um, we should do that. I think I'm going to follow up on trying to get engineers down the five minute walk down here to give us talks and vice versa. We should go up there and give neuro uh, bioengineering talks. Um, 
and let's just create an open forum. Everyone should be working together to promote uh, this discussion. We are in a very unique, so there's very few places in the country where the hospital and neurosciences are this close to engineering. We should really be taking advantage of it. And very strong. <laughs> and they're both extremely All very strong. strong, right? So yeah. it's not, uh, it's not a mom pop shop. Uh, I'd also like to do one more thing before we wrap up. I want Diana, I'd like to thank Diana Vavayan for because she organized this whole thing. She made it happen. The food and uh, AV issues that we had all of a sudden the projector died yesterday and she magically fixed it. So thank you so much for making this happen. Thank this you. was really fantastic. You all coming out. We really enjoyed it. So Thank you to everyone. Thank yeah. you.